Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the BR seminar series. Uh, today, I'm honored to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Saad Saleh from uh, Rice University. Uh, before we start, uh, let me give you a brief introduction uh, about uh, Dr. Saleh. Dr. Saleh received a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1991 in the area of robust feedback control theory. He joined Shell Development Company in Houston in 1991 and served as a research engineer until 2023, uh, focusing on applications of advanced digital signal processing and systems theory uh, to seismic data processing and interpretation, including a statistical pattern recognition, noise attenuation, data compression, and novel applications of multidimensional hexagonal sampling to speed up uh, seismic imaging. From 24 to 28, Dr. Saleh led the new detection methods uh, R&D team in Shell International EMP with res responsibility for developing and deploying new geophysical techniques beyond traditional seismic methods with emphasis on control source, uh, source uh, electromagnetics and high resolution gravity and magnetic capabilities. Uh, from 29 to 2018, Dr. Saleh managed uh, Shell's uh, Integrated Geoscience R&D program, a large international uh, multidisciplinary team focused on creating new exploration technologies uh, via the application of recent breakthroughs in computational science and machine learning to integrate the latest advances in geology, geophysics, and petrophysics. The program was also responsible for developing deep water national seep detection capabilities using autonomous uh, underwater uh, vehicles. After retiring from Shell, uh, Dr. Saleh joined Rice University as professor in the practice, uh, where his current research interests are uh, focused on complex uh, emerge, uh, emergent uh, systems and their applications in engineering and the natural sciences with particular emphasis on feedback control of multi-agent networks. So without further ado, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Saleh to start uh, his talk. So Dr. Saleh, you're okay. welcome to, to yeah. share your screen. I'll share my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Saha, for this introduction. And, and, and thank you, Mark, and everybody else at BEG for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen. All right, so here is the title of the talk, Fleets of Autonomous Vehicles for Geophysical Sensing, uh, the Role of Formation Control Systems. And usually I like to start with my takeaway message. Basically, if, if you remember only one thing from this talk, what should it be? Uh, and the takeaway message is that this is a feasibility study on the applicability of formation control theory and robust network theory to autonomous geophysical data acquisition. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Let's, let's uh, be a bit more specific and see what this really means. Um, geophysical data acquisition is expensive, is time consuming and often hazardous. Uh, and I'm not talking about just seismic data acquisition. This really applies to also potential fields, to electromagnetics and so on. So I think we all agree there is always room for improvement on all three fronts. Um, we, can do, we can do things quicker and faster and cheaper and safer. And to, to that end, uh, the development of autonomous vehicles uh, over the last 20, 30 years has played a major role and they have penetrated geophysical data acquisition. So for example, now we see drones being used for uh, potential fields data acquisition. Uh, we see AUVs in, in marine environments being used to deploy and retrieve uh, ocean bottom sensors or nodes uh, and so on. And that's a great thing. It has really helped a lot. Uh, however, the issue is that most of these applications use these autonomous vehicles individually or maybe in very small groups. Uh, there are many emerging applications where you really need a very large number of these sensors to uh, cooperate and move collectively as, as a team, so to speak. And, and that area has been underexplored. Uh, so putting that 
aside for a minute, sort of independent of, of the geophysics research area, there has been developments in two other sort of somewhat unrelated fields in the last 15 years or so with really promising results that can impact the problem that I just mentioned. One of them is, well, one of them comes from the engineering world and that's under the umbrella of uh, formation control theory. Uh, basically, well, whether it's electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, there's a lot of different breakthroughs that happened uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, most of those have not been applied to geophysics. So that's like one motivation, if you will. Uh, the second motivation is, comes from a different area of research, uh, mostly applied physics and computer science, and it's related to robust networks. Basically, these are the folks who have Say about 20 years ago, people began to get really uh, worried about the safety of the internet. Uh, what would happen if, if it was attacked, if, you know, if the infrastructure was attacked? So a lot of developments happened uh, to create robust networks. And uh, both of these fields have a lot of rich new results that I think can sort of come in and, and impact uh, geophysical data acquisition in a very positive way. Okay, so for the first half of the talk, I'll be talking about formation control more or less. And the second half, I'll, I'll bring in robust networks. Now, when you say formation control, we might as well start by defining what we mean by uh, formation. A formation is basically, or loosely speaking, is a collection of agents. And by agents, I mean, it could be animals, it could be uh, robots, it could be sensors, whatever they, you know, whatever you like. It's a collection of agents uh, that moves to acquire and to maintain a certain geometric shape based on their relative distances. Uh, and typically when you mention the word formation, most people think of one of these two examples. Uh, we know that birds fly in formations and we know that military aircraft fly in formations. And the joke goes that if, if nature deemed it important enough to endow animals to move in formations, and if the military deemed it important enough to be worthy of spending money on it, then it must be really important. So there are many advantages to really moving together in a formation. Uh, in the case of, of birds and, 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 and military aircraft, uh, much of the uh, advantage comes from aerodynamic efficiency. In fact, so much so that there are now uh, a number of commercial airlines that are seriously beginning to consider the idea of flying commercial airlines in formations because they figure they can save uh, a lot of money on fuel costs. Having said all of this, uh, within the last, again, within the last 20 years or so, there has been an explosion of interest uh, from the engineering community to use formations in new applications. So for example, now you hear about people talking about uh, satellite formations. Uh, if you think about it, you know, if, let's say you wanna do astronomy, obviously it's a lot more efficient to do uh, astronomical observations above the atmosphere than from the earth's surface. But it's a very big challenge to uh, deploy a really huge mirror uh, up in the atmosphere. So one way to do this is to launch a number of satellites uh, each one with a relatively small mirror, but they can uh, cooperate uh, together to create effectively a, a large mirror uh, up in space. But then the preservation of their geometric distances is very critical. And of course, you know, the flip side of it is, is satellite formations for earth monitoring is also uh, a new big thing. Another example comes from uh, wildfire uh, management where drones are beginning to use uh, uh, more frequently for that. And that also requires uh, formation control. Now, uh, the trick in information control is what information needs to be exchanged between the agents. For example, if you think about the birds, really only the first bird needs to know where it's going, so to speak. All the other birds like just need to know, need to be able to communicate with one other bird and then the formation is preserved. The question from an engineering point of view is, is it sufficient to communicate just with the nearest bird or do you need more or less? And of course, from an engineering point of view, the question is, you know, you, you, you talk about questions of speed of, of response and things of that sort. So the connectivity uh, is very important. 
Now, I spent most of my career doing research in geophysics and geology. So naturally, when I began to dig deeper into the world of formation control, uh, the applications that came to mind were uh, geophysics related. And of course, in geophysics, when you talk about the geometry of sensors, that's at the very heart of geophysical data acquisition. We do this, uh, we do this on land, we do this uh, in marine environments, we do this airborne. It's, it's really all over, uh, just about any application in terms of geophysical data acquisition will, will require some kind of a formation type mechanism. Um, but I decided of the three options, I was gonna begin to look at uh, the marine example, and that's gonna be today's talk. Although just about everything in the theory that we'll be talking about today is applicable to airborne and, and land uh, applications with some changes, of course. Now, this is a slide that uh, I spend a lot of time motivating this when I talk to engineering crowds, uh, or I give a, a sort of a, a version of this talk to engineering folks. Uh, for, for this community at BEG, I think it's, uh, it doesn't really require much explanation. Uh, but the, the dream, if you will, is a cable-free uh, marine seismic data acquisition system. As you know, in, in a typical, and by typical, I mean moving or mobile uh, marine data acquisition, not the uh, sort of uh, static uh, sensors on the ocean bottom. Uh, in, in a typical survey, you have something like hundreds, sometimes thousands of, of hydrophones. Uh, they're being uh, towed by uh, streamer cables that are several kilometers long. Uh, you have to maneuver for hundreds of hours and you cover areas on the order of tens to hundreds of square kilometers. So from a logistical point of view, dragging all these cables, really, really long cables, it's, it's a nightmare. So the dream is, could you do the same survey exactly, but cable free? Would you be able to replace every sensor by an autonomous vehicle and let them you know, do the same thing without, uh, without having the cables? Keep in mind, I'm, I'm not advocating we do away with the boat, uh, but the boat can be in that case, much, much smaller and cheaper. And I'll get back to that point in, uh, later in the talk, but uh, the, the focus here is, is, is really cable free to be able to do this without cables. And the last thing I wanna do is to leave you with the impression that this is a solved problem. It is not by any means, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, the reason are multifold. Uh, from a hardware point of view, there are vehicles out there today, such as AUVs and gliders and what have you, that can more or less do the job that I just described, but the problem is gonna be costs because most of these vehicles that are available today are quite expensive. And if you're gonna use hundreds or thousands of them, uh, it may become uh, prohibitively expensive to do it for, for a seismic uh, point of view. Having said that, this is a very active area of research and there are very encouraging new developments about new vehicles that are cheaper, smaller and so on. So, so this is uh, sort of under control, let's say in, in, in the foreseeable future. The other problem is localization and navigation. As we all know, electromagnetic waves do not propagate in conductors when of course seawater is a conductor. So for example, if you have these vehicles underwater, there is no way they can have GPS signals. They will not know where they are in an absolute sense. So, uh, and they, they will have to try to figure out where they are using communication. Most likely it's gonna have to be acoustic communication. Uh, and once you, and, and, that's, and that in itself is a problem. Of course, if they are relatively close to each other, then acoustic communication is okay but uh, there's gonna be bandwidth issues. So you're not gonna be able to exchange a whole lot of data. Whatever you do from an algorithmic point of view, it has to be uh, limited in terms of uh, bandwidth. There's gonna be communication delay. Obviously sound waves are much slower than electromagnetic waves and you have to take that into consideration. And of course the water environment is very, very noisy. So you have to also live with that issue. Um, so I guess I want to say that the reason I put this slide here is, is to press that this is, we're just scratching the surface. There is a lot of difficulties from a hardware point of view, but my motivation for today's talk, and 
is not to focus on the hardware issues, because as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of really great progress. And I think in the foreseeable future, most of these problems will be resolved. The problem I wanna, I wanna focus on is more or less the algorithmic aspect. How do these vehicles communicate with each other to stay in a formation? And to do that, we will be doing some simulations based on a miniature survey just for, for numerical simulations. So we're gonna assume that we have a mini survey with 15 nodes. Uh, they're uh, organized in three rows. Each row has five nodes. Uh, the inline distance is 25 meters and the cross line distance is 100 meters. So uh, you know, even though this image shows them you know, overlapping, uh, this is just an artifact of, of plotting. And obviously there are distances both inline and cross line. I wanna start them here at a certain location and then we're gonna have to uh, try to move them in a straight line and then do a U-turn and come back. And that kind of maneuver is tricky. That's why I wanted to test that. Uh, the approximate speed is three meters per second, but that's that's typically what, how a seismic uh, survey moves, but it's a bit too fast for today's vehicles. Uh, it would have to be uh, reduced uh, uh, for the autonomous vehicles. But but again, that's not really an issue. It's just a number and, and reduction of the speed it does not change any of these results. Okay, so what I wanna do next is, is explain the system, the dynamic system, both mathematically and then uh, how it uh, do some numerical uh, aspects to see whether this can be done at all. Uh, we are going to assume that the uh, vehicles are fully actuated and can be represented by as, as uh, point masses. Uh, by fully actuated, I mean, basically, we're gonna assume that each vehicle, you can, you can apply a, a control to move it in any direction you like. You're not restricted in that sense. And by saying that they can be represented as point masses, what I'm saying is that uh, the, each vehicle can be specified in terms of its position and velocity coordinates, but we don't have to worry about its orientation. These assumptions, will simplify the analysis. Uh, some people might object that they're oversimplifying, but I would argue that in an underwater environment, they're not. Uh, if you were on land, then they can be quite restrictive, but there are new uh, autonomous vehicles, marine autonomous vehicles that are fully actuated, that are being developed and that can actually, and they're kind of spherical in, uh, uh, in their shape. So they, uh, uh, they can be represented as point masses, meaning that the orientation is not that important. So having said all of this, uh, then the problem becomes fairly easily tractable. Basically, we are gonna represent each vehicle by a position vector and a velocity vector. So we need three numbers for its position, three numbers for its velocity at any point in time. And we're gonna assume that uh, there is a control or a force acting on it at any point in time, which is also three-dimensional. X, Y, and Z. Uh, if you live with these assumptions, then the mathematics of the of the description becomes uh, high school physics. It's really simple. I mean, just basically says the derivative of the of the position is the velocity, and the derivative of the velocity is the force. But since we're assuming unit mass for each, then the force is uh, sorry, it's acceleration. But since we're assuming unit mass, then the uh, uh, the acceleration is just the force, which is the, the controlling factor. So U sub I for any of the I's, any of the nodes is gonna be the force that we apply that we wanna design basically. Um, and for the, for the formation geometry itself, we're gonna assume that it's given by certain positions and velocities. I will call them PI star and VI star. So each node now can be described as uh, its own position and velocity, but also the desired position and velocity, which comes from the formation itself. And we assume that each node can uh, communicate only with a few very close neighbors. And, and that NI is the set of neighbors for the ice node. With that simple setup, then the problem can be formulated as follows. We wanna design a controller uh, for each node as a function of the relative positions and velocities between the node and its neighbors so that the position as a function of time approaches the desired position and same thing for the velocities. Uh, and that's how they're gonna acquire the formation. 
this problem, if, if it wasn't for the words relative, if each vehicle could actually measure its absolute position and velocity, let's say you know, if it had access to its GPS information, the problem would be trivial. But because we're assuming that they cannot access their uh, absolute positions and velocities, they would have to rely on this on these relative positions, uh, only whatever they can communicate. So, for example, if you're 25 meters away from the nearing no uh, nearby node, you can communicate. You, you can communicate and, and and tell that distance. Uh, <clears throat> that makes it a, a much more difficult problem. In fact, so much so that, as stated, uh, this problem has no solution. Uh, if if I assume that uh, none of them uh, has access. Uh, to a global coordinate system, then then this thing is not going to work. And you can actually show that here. There's a simulation of the best you can do uh, in a world where uh, there is no um, information. And it, I know it's kind of funny. See, they they <laughs> they go around in 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 position. And the only reason they moved a little bit to the right is because I gave them some inertia to begin with. But you're not you're not going to be successful. The only way you can really attack this problem is to compromise and assume that you have a leader following approach. So uh, so that brings me to this slide right here. So to solve the problem, we are going to assume that one of the nodes is gonna be a leader, meaning that it's gonna be towed by the boat. Remember I said, we're not, we're not gonna abandon the boat, but it's gonna be a very small boat. And in fact, you really need to have a boat because you know, there's a lot of unforeseen things that can happen. So you don't want them to be completely on their own. So it's good to have a small boat and that boat will tow uh, one receiver, but then all the other receivers will interact uh, in a wireless fashion through acoustic signals, so to speak, each one with its two neighbors uh, on the, uh, in the inline direction. If you're willing to do that, then the problem can be solved. Uh, and, uh, I don't want to go through the details of the algorithm, but uh, maybe just for uh, for completeness, uh, let me say that I was inspired by a couple of papers, one by Hong et al. in 2006, and another one by Ren and Atkins in 2007, who tackled this problem uh, or something very similar to it and proposed a control law, basically an equation for UI, which measures the distance, uh, the, the, the errors between uh, uh, the different uh, positions and velocities within the neighborhoods uh, and then applies that. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna be applying that uh, to the example. And then in fact, for the benefit of time, let me skip this one as well. Actually, let me just say one more thing here. Basically this control law has a couple of constants, GP and GV. These are user specified constants. You can use them, of course, uh, the larger the number, the, the more expensive you expect the, uh, the application will be. So uh, having, for example, a, a small number like GR, well, this should be GP, sorry for the typo. GP and GV equals 0.05. Uh, let me do a quick simulation. Will will do the job in the sense that the uh, they will follow the trajectory they should follow. Keep in mind this guy here is the uh, is the leader, but they they wobble as you can see <laughs> quite a bit, uh, and that wobbling is a result of being uh, um, of using a gain factor that is too small. Uh, but that's a user specified param parameter. You can. Uh, to uh, raise it up by a factor of five. So if, if GP and GV are 0.5, then you can see that uh, the simulation becomes uh, a lot more well-behaved and you can actually achieve uh, the, uh, the formation geometry uh, very accurately indeed. Uh, and again, this is based on a simulation where the only communication is between each uh, node and its two nearest neighbors in the inline direction. And by communication, I mean, it can measure the distance and, and the velocity and the relative distance and the velocity, which is fairly easy to do with acoustic modems in this case. So it is, it should be fairly doable. I also wanna, don't wanna leave you with the impression that that's just a numerical uh, modeling exercise. Uh, there is some, uh, 
I don't want to say advanced math, but there was some quant uh, quantitative analysis behind this to prove that actually this is going to be a stable system and it will do the job, uh, which um, most of this is, is being published. And in fact, this is going to be presented at the next EAGE conference where we will go into the details of the, of the underlying math to prove, to prove that this is not just a numerical exercise. This is, you can actually show that this will be stable, that this formation will be met. And, and this is the error function. So uh, good. So that, that wraps up the first part of the presentation, which is, can you create a, a, a force dynamics for each uh, vehicle so that they can acquire the formation and stay with the formation? And the answer is, it seems like it can under the assumptions that we started with. Um, but what about robustness? And to, to uh, motivate this question, let me go back here and look at this little example. Imagine if this node, uh, the one on the top right corner, somehow fails. Okay, one node fails, it's not the end of the world. But the problem with this setup is that the whole row, that whole top row, you've just lost it because they all communicate through that node that you just lost. So in, in, in some sense, you've lost one node, uh, well, I'm sorry, one node failed, but you've lost one third of your survey. So that's really unacceptable. And, and, and the way to deal with this robustness issue is to say, okay, I'm gonna allow some of these uh, vehicles to communicate or to exchange position and velocity information not just inline, but also crossline. Now, because crossline distances are larger than inline distances, that kind of communication is going to be expensive to do crossline. And so, we don't want all of them to communicate crossline because that would add to the cost quite a bit. We want to do the minimum number of crossline communication that would allow for integrity of uh, the survey that 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 the thing would still function. And that's going to be the next question I want to address. So to, uh, to go back, okay, so here's the robustness question. We wanna explore the, the ability of the formation to maintain some level of integrity in the face of random node failures. Um, so what do I mean by some level of integrity? We basically have to quantify that. Uh, so we need to choose a proxy to characterize the integrity of the surviving network after a fraction f of the nodes fail randomly. And in this regard, I'm going to use something called, it's an order parameter, it's called p infinity, which is quite popular among the people who do uh, percolation theory in physics and applications uh, to network robustness. Uh, P infinity is defined as the probability that a randomly chosen surviving node belongs to the largest cluster in the surviving network. Now that's a little bit of a mouthful. I think the easiest way to think about it is that P infinity gives you, tells you something about the likelihood uh, of the surviving network after a few or, or after a fraction of the nodes fail, the likelihood that the surviving network will be connected and therefore will, will achieve the job that you want. It will survive the, uh, the disaster, if you will. Um, now, intuitively, if you think about it, uh, this function should be a decreasing function of F, meaning that the larger the number of nodes that fail, uh, the smaller the likelihood is that the surviving uh, network is connected. That makes a lot of sense, it's, it's intuitive. The, the surprising element is that it doesn't decrease in a gradual manner, but it decreases in what we call a phase transition manner. So here's an example just to explain what I mean by that. This example assumes that we have a two dimensional lattice network. So this comes from directly from percolation theory. This, this particular example here is not related to the seismic example I'm talking about, but just to, to, to uh, explain a point. Imagine you have a mesh, a 2D mesh of of a network. Uh, imagine that you remove randomly 10% of, uh, of the nodes in that network. Is the remaining network connected? Uh, according to this plot, uh, for 10% failure, you go back, you, you see P infinity is, is almost one. So it, it, you're 
very close or the likelihood of the surviving network being connected is very, very high. And it remains high for quite some time until in this example, until we reach a node failure rate of about 35%. And after that, it just collapses. Uh, and from node failure of about 50% onward, uh, you're, you're in big trouble. I mean, the, the connectedness of the surviving network just goes out the window. So that's a very interesting behavior and it, it points to, and this is why you know, it's, it's very analogous to phase transition in physics, kind of like going from you know, liquid to gas or something like that. Uh, and the threshold or the critical threshold is what we call F sub C. This is basically the fraction of nodes that randomly fail, which make the surviving network collapse. That is something that you wanna, from an engineering point of view, try to compute and maximize as much. Basically, you wanna design a network so that FC is maximized so that you can be as robust as possible. Now, for the kind of networks that we're using in this uh, marine seismic example, computation of this F FC is a bit tricky. So we have to do it numerically. So, you know, for random networks, actually, there is like a closed form expression for it, but for, uh, for uh, the kind of network that we're dealing with here, uh, we need to do it numerically. And so I've been using Monte Carlo uh, algorithms to try to compute this. And the way I would apply this to try to go back to our seismic example is as follows. Uh, I wanna introduce a new parameter and let's call it Delta sub C. That is the node increment for cross line communication. What that means, and this is by the way, plotted here on the X axis. What it means is that if delta C, for example, equals three, then I'm going to allow every third node or every third vehicle to communicate with its neighbors in the cross line direction. So not each one. If I go to <clears throat> delta sub C equals 10, then I'm going to allow every 10th node to communicate in the cross line direction. So in some sense, you can think of values of small delta C. These are like expensive surveys because that means there is a lot of cross-line communication going on. Values with large delta C, nine or 10, they are like inexpensive surveys because they are um, allowing only infrequent cross-line communication. And what, then what I wanna do is for each one of these delta Cs, I'm gonna try to compute that critical threshold of, of the failure rate that we talked about. Basically this, this line here that we were talking about earlier. So I do that for, uh, went in the wrong direction. So I do that for each one of these delta Cs and then I generate this plot. So the, the way to use this plot to, uh, to analyze our problem is you start with the Y axis, if you will. So basically you tell me what is the expected node failure, you know, given a certain marine environment or, or given a certain application. Let's say you tell me I, I can tolerate up to 5% node failure. Oh, that's what you know, the worst case I can expect. Okay, so we go here to the y-axis and I look at 0 0.05, that's 5%. And then I read off the delta C associated with it and that's gonna be 10. So that tells me that I need to, if that's the case, if I'm expecting 5% node failures, then I need to connect every 10th node in the cross line direction. If the node failures expected are much larger, so let's say 15%, uh, then, then I need to connect much more frequently, obviously, in the cross-line direction to keep the network intact. I need to connect something like every other node. And that's going to be our design methodology, if you will. You tell me the, uh, the expected node failures, and then I can design a survey uh, to go with it. And uh, to show you how that would work, we're going to do some more simulations. I'm not going to do the U-turn thing here. Uh, we're going to go in a straight line, but we're gonna add many, many more nodes. So instead of just five nodes, we're gonna do 250 nodes. And the reason is now we're dealing with probabilities and statistics. So it doesn't make sense to just deal with five nodes. You really need a bigger number. So uh, we're gonna have 250 nodes, 250 nodes in, in five lines. Uh, and the first example I'm gonna show is a case where you expect 5% node failure. Uh, and as this, shows if it's 5%, then connecting, uh, then an, in, an inexpensive survey will, will do the job. Basically, I can connect every 10th node and that should do the job. And this simulation basically shows that. So uh, now the, uh, the nodes that you see sort of 
escaping as just basically a sloppy simulation on my part. Basically, these, these, these are the, float, the, the floating ones are the ones that failed. Uh, and then everything else uh, hangs together, even though you can see some gaps here. So, uh, but they still hang together and they move because uh, of the cross-line communication that's going on. Now, on the other hand, let's say instead of 5% uh, node failure, I expect, uh, or what happens is 15%. Well, if it's 15%, then this inexpensive survey is just not gonna do the job. It, the whole thing is gonna collapse. Um, and so let me do that. Let's, 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 oh, sorry, it's all one. So here's a 15 per, simulation for 15% node failures using the inexpensive, inexpensive survey, meaning that we're connecting a cross line every 10th node. Uh, and then we do a simulation and we see that it's bad news. So even though I'm losing only 15%, all the other ones that are still connected in, in linear mode, if you will, they're still connected, but they're not following the leader. They just completely lost it. And, uh, and the whole survey collapses. Which is to say that if you expect 15% uh, failure, then you need to use a slightly more expensive survey, meaning that you need a few more cross-line connections. And indeed, as a plot showed us here, uh, if, if, if the threshold is 15% node failure, then uh, I need to connect every other node. In fact, even with every third node, it works fine. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. Uh, okay, so this is the case of 15% node failures uh, and every third node is connected in the cross line direction. And if we do the simulation, uh, even though I'm losing 15%, uh, so floating around, all the others remain connected and they, they, uh, they move together. So this is basically just a methodology, if you will, a design framework that I offer that if you're gonna do formation control for autonomous vehicles. And, and as I said at the beginning, it doesn't have to be seismic, this could be any, uh, any formation, could be airborne or, or, or whatever. Uh, this approach allows you to study the trade-offs between cost of the survey and, uh, and, and the robustness and what, what kind of node failure level can you tolerate. Okay, with that, uh, let me come to the conclusion slide. Uh, and wrap it up here. Uh, I have two conclusions. The first one is just basically a summary. This was really a feasibility study to explore applicability of robust formation control theory as a design framework to enable efficient autonomous mobile geophysical sensing. The second conclusion is something a bit more sort of out of scope in a way. Uh, I, I wanted to emphasize that formation control theory is a branch of a field called multi-agent dynamic systems, which is concerned with how collective macro behavior emerges out of localized interactions uh, that are really simple among individual agents. So really emergent complex phenomena, if you will. So formation control is one little example, but there's a lot more really underneath uh, the hoods here. Uh, and I've seen those applications penetrate in a lot of different uh, sciences. So I've seen it being applied in biology, in medicine, and certainly in physics, uh, and, and many other applications. Uh, I think there is great potential for using some of these uh, modeling techniques for certain geological phenomena. Uh, again, having sort of spent uh, most of my career in the geoscience world, uh, and recently digging deeper into multi-agent dynamic systems, I do see the potential for marrying the two in a, in a very uh, nice way. This uh, space is largely underexplored. I mean, obviously there are a number of publications out there, but, but very limited to compare to other sciences. And it's something that is close to my heart. And uh, I would just, uh, I thought I would mention it here as part of the conclusion, because if there's anybody in BEG who is interested in this aspect, then uh, please do feel free to contact me and I'd, I'd be very interested in exploring it further. And with that, uh, I'll just say thank you and uh, happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saleh, for your uh, great presentation. Um, so I see a couple of questions in the chat box. The first one is from Sayed Hosseini. Uh, Sayed, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question? Um, sure, I hope you can hear me. Um, just the last couple of slides, I was just curious, you know, why most failures is happening at the very beginning of the simulation. And when it goes, moves forward, there is not as many failures. Is there a specific reason for that? Um, yeah, it, no, there is no specific reason for that. I, 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 I've done these simulations a long time ago, to be honest with you, and I need to go back and, and look at uh, whether that was, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, at every time step, you you can you can assume more and more of them fail. In this case, I guess the simulation is that most of the failures happen early in the in the process. But there is nothing that prevents you from doing this at any time step. Obviously, as long as you don't exceed the threshold, because uh, yeah, each one of these is is there to uh, explore whether with that particular threshold the survey continues to be intact or not whether they all happen at the very beginning or, or, uh, or distributed as time goes by, I think should be not a problem as long as you don't exceed the 15% or the 5% threshold. Yeah, thank you. But I think it would be great to, I mean, I, I have, I don't know if you, if you can take a look at your code and see if, you know, there is something or a parameter sort of controlling that type of behavior. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, sure. I know that's a very good point, actually. I, I think, uh, I mean, you triggered something in my head that I need to go back and look at. Um, the, um, the, the point here is that these are all random failures. Uh, and indeed, the, the, the world of robust network analysis uh, is very rich. And, and you, could, you could envision, for example, uh, other kinds of failures where there is correlations or, or dependencies between them. Uh, but this is sort of the simplest kind of, of robustness question where they're just completely random and they happen essentially at any time. Yeah. Thanks. In fact, uh -huh. there is a, just to, to add to this point a little bit, I mean, there are uh, people who study network robustness, such as the internet. The internet is incredibly robust because it has hubs and it's so-called a scale-free network. Uh, so from a random failure point of view, it is incredibly robust. But if somebody decides to attack the hubs directly, then, then it's catastrophic. And so it depends really on how the failures happen, whether they're completely random, you know, uh, uh, out of nowhere, or whether they are being attacked and it becomes a whole different matter. I'm hoping that for seismic applications, nobody's gonna attack the, the survey, but you never know. Okay, next question is from Mark. Uh, Mark, would you like to go ahead with your question? Uh, yeah, hi, Saad. Yeah, that was a, you know, a fun talk uh, on the basis of just learning how these uh, systems uh, can work. I, I'm just curious, you know, when you look at natural systems like um, flocking birds or schooling fish, you know, do you, is there any insight as to how much cross communication there is between each individual and, and others? And yeah, how that might compare to what you're simulating? Uh, there is, in fact, there is a tremendous amount of literature on trying to understand what kind of communication takes place between the animals when they move collectively. Um, and, and of course, a lot of it is done even from an inverse theory point of view. So there are people who spend a lot of time uh, filming the animal movement and they try to sort of reverse engineer uh, what's going on. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, but from my readings, it seems that almost in all cases, the interaction is very localized. So uh, each bird is communicating at most with maybe five or six birds around it, no more than that. Even when they move, like, you know, startlings uh, are very famous for so-called murmurations. These are you know, European birds that make fantastic geometric shapes when they move. And they've been well studied. And it seems like every bird communicates with no more than five or six birds around it. Um, and it's very simple communication. Um, but somehow 
amazingly, they can uh, move at an incredible speed without colliding with each other and they can change their direction incredibly fast also without collisions so there is a lot of people feel that we still have a lot to learn from them we don't we haven't really figured out exactly what they're doing um, and in some sense people who study even neuroscience are of course intrigued by this because if you think about it even the human you know the brain it's just a bunch of neurons where each cell communicates with a few cells around it, a few other neurons through some electric or chemical signal through some very basic, simple communication. Uh, but somehow collectively what emerges out of this is the human brain with all, this, with all this complexity. That bridge between the local simple communication and how the collective behavior emerges is one of the biggest mysteries is still uh, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of research on it, but I don't think it has been figured out yet. And of course, the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico is reason for existence is to study this problem. And they, uh, they are like the center of gravity in the world to uh, study complexity science. Yeah, it's a, I find it fascinating. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I do not see any other question in the chat box. Uh, but I would like to go ahead with the next question. So Saad, you showed a graph showing parameter delta C, uh, which is used to quantify the node failure. So I just wonder if you um, use any kind of optimization method to optimize this parameter for any specific you know, equipment? Uh, I didn't, uh, but there are ways to do this now the combinatorics of the problem can, can become really uh, difficult. Ironically, as I mentioned in the talk, if, if you assume the network is a random network, uh, then you can actually derive a closed form expression for the critical threshold F sub C. Uh, and then you can uh, formulate an optimization problem to maximize uh, F sub C. In its most generic form, it's a very difficult problem. But if you are willing to impose some constraints on the topology of the network, uh, then it becomes tractable. Uh, so for example, if you say the network, is, I mean, you know, they, they come in different names. There's like a star-shaped network and there is a you know, diamond-shaped network and so on. Uh, now the network that I've been using is essentially a mesh network. Uh, and what I have done is sort of a poor man's optimization, if you will. So I've done it by assuming that, I said, I'm gonna only assume cro cross line connections are the, the only uh, variable that I can play with. The end line connections are all in there. So by, by reducing the problem to, to that level, it becomes, fairly easy to optimize. And that's essentially what I, what I did here. Uh, in a more, gen I mean, in, in, if I wanna think about the next optimization problem or the next research problem, you could, you could formulate the problem as follows. You can say, all right, I have, let's say 500 vehicles that are gonna acquire the seismic survey, uh, but I'm gonna impose no constraints on the connections whatsoever. And I just want the optimization problem to give me the optimal way to connect them. Now, the solution to that problem, as I just stated it, it's actually well known that the solution is a scale-free network. And a scale-free network is basically, if you think about the internet, uh, or if you think about, if, if you think about the, the airline hub network, if you, you know, if you've ever looked at the, at the back end of the, of the magazine at an airline and you've seen how they design their uh, networks, you know, this is all usually like five major hubs and then everything, everything goes from there. It turns out this is the most efficient design, if you will, for connecting a large number of nodes. Um, and it is the solution to the optimization problem that you're talking about. So one can envision a geophysical survey that is hub-based. You have a few major hubs and everything else feeds from them. 
um, that is incredibly robust in the face of random nodes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, the, the problem becomes really interesting is that if, if you are dealing with networks that could potentially be under attack by some adversary, then, then that becomes a bit problematic because then the adversary can just go after the hubs and, and it becomes an issue. So there's a trade-off and there are, there's a lot of literature on, pe on people trying to use some kind of a combination of the two, random failures versus attack and, and, and to solve the optimization problem that way. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but it is a very interesting optimization application field and uh, the, the most generic problem is not fully solved, certainly not in terms of geophysics. Thank you very much. It was uh, clear enough to me. Uh, Mahdi has a question. Mahdi, would you like to unmute your mic? Yeah. Hello, do you, yes. <clears throat> Sad, uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. Uh, I see an analogy between this and percolation theory in porous media. <clears throat> So in that theory, so the, the probability to make the percolation is more than 40%. So I was wondering if this discrepancy between your case and uh, that threshold in percolation theory is because of size of problem that you have. Maybe if you consider bigger problem, you can reach to these values. Uh, I think you may be correct. Yeah, I think you may be correct. So, so indeed, uh, percolation theory was sort of the backbone uh, that was used to develop robust network theory in, in the early 2000s. Um, and if you apply it to a mesh, to a 2D mesh, then you're talking about a 40% uh, threshold. There's also the point of how do you, where do you define the threshold? Uh, uh, in the case of percolation theory, uh, usually the threshold is chosen at a point where uh, the expected value of k squared over the expected value of k is, is equals two. And by k, I mean the degree distribution of, of the network. So the number of nodes each, the number of links each node has. Uh, and that is chosen for certain reasons. If I had chosen the same uh, definition for the threshold, I would have had higher uh, numbers than what I showed you. Uh, I decided to move the threshold a little bit so that uh, I took the integrity of the surviving network to mean 90% of the network is, has survived. And that changes the threshold a little bit. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, as you mentioned, I'm dealing with a finite number that I'm just doing Monte Carlo simulations on Whereas percolation theory in general deals with the limits, if you will, as the number of nodes goes to infinity for really, really large networks. And, and that's another source of the difference in the answer. But, uh, but that is really the way to go, is to apply reverse, in, uh, re reverse percolation theory, if you will, to study this problem uh, deeper. Yeah, thank you so much. Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sad. <clears throat> I do not see any other question in the chat box. Um, is there any other questions or comments uh, for Sad? All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And uh, it was thank you very much for your time and for the great explanation regarding the questions. Thank um, you, Sad. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.